So sorry about that. Hi, you guys. This is a challenge. I just want you to know I have to look at a camera. I don't even know if I'm looking at the right place. And then I have to scroll through my notes because I made some notes because I'm not just ad-libbing here today. So, um, so be patient with me. But um, I am quite excited to be in touch with you again. It's a weird way to be in contact. I'm just doing this so that it min minimizes my double chin and my wrinkles. But okay. So, um, yeah, but I, guys, we're reconnecting because on Sunday we would have started our second YPM at mid-church term. And it goes without saying that it would have been really awesome to be reunited and together again. But we must just be patient. The time will come and it is going to be a very special time when we are able to meet up again. And we just got to hang in there and, and get through this COVID thing. This term we are continuing with the salvation story that we started at the beginning of the year. It feels like a very, very long time ago. I want to just do a short recap uh, before I introduce you to the topic that we will be starting on Sunday and that we will continue to do over the next few weeks. You will recall that the Salvation Story series started in the Old Testament with Genesis where we took a look at creation. We discussed the ins and the outs of the creation narrative. We talked about dinosaurs and um, very old trees and 6,000 years and hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but we came up with the fact that uh, the creation narrative demonstrated God's desire to have a relationship with humankind and for us to live in harmony, not only with him, but with ourselves and with other people and with nature. And in addition to paradise in the garden and a life of harmony, we were given the gift of choice. God did not create robots. He created people. And yes, the people chose to go against God. Adam and Eve chose to take Satan up on his tempting offer of chomping on the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did this, they chose against God. They revolted against him. And that was a very big problem. Sin had entered the world. And everybody involved was a little bit messed up because of it. So first and foremost, God is so good that he cannot be near to evil. So Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. Humankind was separated from God and their relationship with him was no longer in harmony. Everything else that was also once in harmony was also disturbed. So people's relationships with themselves, with each other, with nature, it was all disrupted. God was so upset by it all that he even tried to do a big cleanup. But despite the flood just wiping out a whole lot of evil people, the problem of sin persisted. Of course, because God is God, he had a plan. And this plan started with one man, Abraham. And a covenant that God had made with Abraham. God promised Abraham that he would become a great nation with many descendants. And that every other nation on earth would be blessed through this nation, which was Israel. He promised that they would have a piece of land to live on and in return that they, starting with Abraham, must be obedient to him. And I suppose that this sounds pretty simple, but it actually wasn't, as we saw. We spent a lot of time chatting about Israel. We looked at how she grew in number and how she grew in strength, how she moved around until she settled into the promised land. And then we looked at how she behaved, which frankly wasn't very well. God gave Israel a set of rules and regulations and he put things in place to deal with sin so that they could regularly atone, thus making right their relationship with him. But it was to no avail. Israel betrayed God over and over again, choosing to worship the false gods of the nations that surrounded them. God would send prophets with a message for Israel to repent and they would turn back to God to avoid punishment. Sometimes they managed to do this, but invariably they reverted back to iniquitous lives of immorality and self-serving. How could Israel ever, ever hope to be a blessing to other nations if she herself was such a mess? Things don't appear to have gone entirely according to God's plan. Sin had not been dealt with and it continued to create immense disharmony. Eventually, God had actually had quite enough. 
He followed through with the punishment that he threatened Israel with, and they were taken from their beloved land into exile in Babylon. The people of Israel were in utter despair in Babylon, grieving and sorrowful. It was into this messy situation that God sent more prophets to them with a message of hope. And this hope was Jesus the Messiah. Jesus Christ, Son of God, would come and complete the job that Israel had been unable to do. Jesus would be the salvation that they could not be. He would redeem his people, replacing their hardened hearts of stone with hearts of flesh and enabling everyone to once again have a deep, loving and intimate relationship with God. And Jesus was born and he grew up and he started his ministry. We spent a few Sundays learning about how Jesus lived his life on earth, which should really be a blueprint for how we live our lives. In Jesus' face-off with Satan, we see him using the scriptures to protect himself from temptation. He explained to Nicodemus how we need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God and have new life. And then when Jesus engaged with the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus showed us that he had come for every person on earth, no matter who they were, where they were born, how much money they had. If they were healthy, sick, black, white, purple, green, etc., etc., Jesus came for every single person on earth. In the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, which we looked at in our first Sunday in lockdown, Jesus showed us that whoever believes in Jesus Christ receives spiritual life, that even spiritual, that even physical death, sorry, cannot take away, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And with that part of the series complete, we went into the Easter services, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday last week. I feel like it's getting quite dark in here because it's the change of the day. It's dusk. Okay, I opened a bit of light there. In a fitting end to all the drama of salvation story, Jesus dies on the cross for all the sin of the world. He is the atoning sacrifice that wipes our hearts clean, leaving them as white as snow. We no longer need to be separated from God. What Jesus does on the cross defeats sin and death once and for all. He's living, he's dying, and he's rising again mean that we too can defeat death and live for eternity with him who saved us if we simply believe in him. And this is where the next part of the series kicks off because the very moment that you declare that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and that you believe in him, the Holy Spirit enters your heart and your life and now you get to live a saved life with the Holy Spirit to guide and to help you. What is a saved life led by the Spirit? It is a life that displays the Holy Spirit's work in you. It is a life that exhibits the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And just like fruit grows on the outside of a plant, of the tree, of the vine, we can see the fruit of the Spirit in Christians. So this fruit becomes the proof or the evidence that we are believers filled with the Spirit. In Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23, we read that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Guys, it's actually very simple. If we're able to live our lives in the Spirit, displaying this fruit, then we will be doing well to be living as Jesus showed us in his example. If we choose a salvation relationship with Jesus, we are no longer separated from God. And if we work on displaying these nine fruits in our lives, we will have harmonious lives that cherish and respect others, ourselves and nature. So over the next term and beyond, we will look at what each of these look like in our lives. If I'm an apple tree, you're going to see apples hanging off my branches. If I'm a love tree, what will you see? If I'm a patience tree, what will you see? If I'm a self-controlled tree, what will you see? Definitely not the vast number of Easter eggs that I ate this season. I'm excited, guys. I'm excited to, to learn about this with you. I'm excited to get together again in this funny, weird way. And of course, I'm very, very excited at the hope of seeing you guys all again after lockdown. But I'll see you on Sunday for our first lesson in the Fruit of the Spirit, Living a Saved Life series. And let's just take a moment to pray together before we end.